I'm excited to be here this weekend. How about you? Oh, uh, yeah. I'm Kyle Dana. I am the Fort Dodge campus pastor and just thrilled to be able to celebrate this weekend with you and bring you not only the word, but an update from, from Fort Dodge and what is happening there and just some exciting things. The first of which... My family is officially Fort Dodge residents. We bought a house last Thursday, we closed, and we are tearing into it this last week, and so we are there, and our neighbors are probably already annoyed with the dirt work that's happening. But we're excited that we are, we're in a neighborhood and we're starting to love on people. We're also excited to be able to share with you that we've hired our other two full-time staff. We've got our family ministry coordinator uh, and, our, and our worship and production coordinator. And both of them and their families are going to be moving in this next weekend. And one of those you probably have seen around, possibly, at our, at our campuses, maybe at yours or maybe here in, in Cedar Falls, and that is Nick Johnson. Excited to be able to, to bring an intern, a, a student who has, has finished our internship program, and he's going to be our family ministry coordinator. And that's super exciting for us in Fort Dodge. A little bit about me, though, so you're not just trying to figure out how old is this guy? Does he have a wife and children? Yes and yes. Uh, I've got a beautiful wife and, and two amazing girls, a four-year-old and a one-year-old. And we are just coming out of Grinnell. My wife grew up and lived in Grinnell. And we just had some tearful moments this last week as we moved out of the house. And I've, I've figured out that those tearful moments weren't the same for me as they were for everybody else. I mean, I, I, I was crying because I was going to have to learn how to cook again. They were crying because it was finally the time that we were moving out after three months. That was funny. We can all laugh. <laughs> all right. Hey, this morning, if you don't have a, or this weekend, if you do not have a Bible or a pen, you can probably find one at, at the end of your row or go ahead and pull out your tablet, get your phone out. We want to make sure our biggest thing around here is that as you track along, we know that, that the Lord is going to speak through his word, my, not just what I have to say to you. And we also just want you to make sure you have a pen. So if you don't have a pen, get your hand up. The ushers will be bringing one down to you. Uh, as you turn to the back of your bulletin, there's a nice spot for you to be able to take notes. And just the breakdown of how this is going to look this weekend, there's going to be uh, three things that I share with you, and, and then our campus pastors are going to come up at the end of the message, and they're going to be giving some application to you. So kind of just go ahead and, and give the breakdown uh, that way on the back of your bulletin. We're going to be wrapping up, this is uh, the, the second to the last message in our Old Testament series, The Plan, and it's an exciting uh, series as we've dug through the Old Testament and been, been able to get a, a deeper understanding, maybe, maybe some new looks at, at the Old Testament. Most of the time we've just skimmed over the Old Testament. If, if we're at home reading, we, we go through things pretty quickly and we just want to get to the story of Jesus. And so hopefully we've been able to, to make some connections for you this, uh, th through this summer series. This weekend where we're going to be is in 1 Kings. And so go ahead and turn there. It's in the Old Testament, obviously, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, and just keep on flipping a little bit farther and you're going to get to 1 Kings. And we're going to be spending all of our time in 1 Kings 18 and 19. And we're going to be studying and, and learning from the prophet Elijah. And hopefully in this time this weekend, as we dig into this, there's going to be three truths that, that apply to our lives and that we can learn from and, and grow in and, and maybe just even simply be reminded of. Things that, that sometimes we might just forget about or things that we might take for granted. But before we dig into this, we're gonna, we're, I, I just want to give you a snapshot of, of Elijah. Uh, interestingly enough, he pops onto the scene in chapter 17. We, we don't know a whole lot about him until there. And as he comes onto the scene, he comes out very bodaciously. He doesn't just tiptoe onto the scene, but he comes out with a very large cry of appeal for the king of kings. And he, and he goes up to Ahab, the king of Israel, and he tells Ahab, listen, there's not going to be any rain except for at, at, at my voice. No dew, no rain. Nothing's going to happen as far as moisture is concerned on the land. And this goes on for three and a half years. And in between, right around the, the three and a half year mark is where we're going to pick up. And, and in chapter 18, verse 16 is where we're going to begin to read. And if you would, just go ahead and follow along with me. Ahab is, is, is confronting the, uh, the, the king of Israel. Elijah is confronting the, king of, uh, confronting the king of Israel, Ahab, here. And he comes in with just this, this loud statement. And, and he comes in and he says this, so Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, in verse 16, Ahab went to meet Elijah. When he saw Elijah, he said to him, is that you, you troubler of Israel? I have not made trouble with Israel, Elijah replied. 
but you and your father's family have. And, and the reason why Ahab comes to him at this is because he's just ticked off for the last three and a half years. There hasn't been any rain on the ground. And he's saying that that is his fault. And, and right away, Elijah points it back to him. He says, no, this is, this is you and your, and your father's fault. You've abandoned the Lord's commands and have followed the Baals. Now summon the people from all over Israel and meet me on Mount Carmel. And bring the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent sent word throughout all Israel and assembled the prophets on Mount Carmel. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if, if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Jezebel, Ahab's wife, had 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 allowed herself to, to, to get into her husband's mind. And, and she, she had convinced him that it was okay to worship Baal. And, and Ahab allowed himself to, to go ahead and, and be soft enough as the king of Israel to say, yeah, this, this is fine. Who's God anyway? And so as, as we see here, there's this, there's this big uprising of, of idol worship. And Elijah is, is commissioned not only to stop the rain, but to go and confront Ahab and what is happening here. Before we go any farther, many of us have, can probably find ourselves in, in one of three camps this weekend. As, as we're sitting wherever we're at, we can probably find ourselves in a position of, of, of wanting to know more about who God is. Is he even real? We, we, we would resonate very well with this, this statement that Elijah just said. Listen, if, if Baal is God, then follow him. But if, if God's God, then follow him. And we're sitting probably wherever we're at when, where we could be in this camp. Is he real? I don't know. I want to know more. And maybe we're in the camp where, where we're just like one of the Israelites who's, who's understood God from the beginning of time. We, we were born and raised in a family who is, who is commissioned and, and, and taught us about God. But somehow, quite frequently, we find ourselves asking the question, how in the world did our number one drop farther than number three? Or maybe we're sitting here this weekend and we could just simply ask the question, maybe, maybe we're in the camp and just simply wavering. We know, but we like something else a little bit more. We know but maybe we just don't care enough. And so here we have Elijah and he stands face to face with the king of the Israelites and and he he pleads with the people. Verse 21, let's read it again. Elijah went before the people and said, how long will you waver between two opinions? How long? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal is God, follow him. But the people said nothing. Wouldn't it be fitting right there uh, for, for God to, to, to rage with anger? Wouldn't it be fitting right there for you and I would probably relate a lot more with an attitude. When, when we're used to asking somebody a question, we expect a response and the people stood in silence. They're a lot like you and I. They've got a lot, of, got a lot on their heart and a lot on their mind and they want to know, is he? What do I need to do? What's Elijah gonna do? First point I wanna give you, God's plan moves forward even if we're wavering. We're gonna look forward here in just a second, but but God's plan moves forward even if we're wavering. It would have been so fitting for God just to smite at everybody right there who's in that crowd who said nothing. What do you mean you don't have a voice for who I am? Haven't I proven enough of myself to you yet? How can you be silent? But this isn't anything new to God. Like we understood weeks ago when we started this with the first domino, when sin entered the world, God's plan started. 
his plan to redeem his people, his plan to, to make himself known amongst his people, even in their sinful hearts and minds. And his plan goes on today. He wants to continue to help us understand. And so his plan doesn't cease. His plan moves forward even if we are wavering. His plan doesn't depend on our faith. Our faith is dependent upon his plan. His plan doesn't depend on our faith. Our faith is dependent on his plan. And it makes me just for a moment in my flesh start to wonder what I would have said at that moment. Would I want to still be where my fists are tight, wanting to, 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 to rage out with anger and fight? Or could I see myself like the people, silent? From there, as, as we just trek along through the next couple of paragraphs and verses, things get pretty intense and, and pretty awesome and powerful. We have Elijah commands that the prophets of, that, that two bulls are brought forth and, and that the prophets of Baal uh, set up their, their altar and, and prepare the fire and, and then he will set up his and, and Baal gets to choose their bull first and then he will choose his and, and, and he will let them call upon their God and he will call upon his God and, and whichever God rains down fire, that is gonna be who God is. The, the most powerful understanding of, of just that piece of history here is this. Elijah didn't doubt. It, it was beyond not doubting that God would light his fire. He also understood that Baal wasn't going to light their fire. And it's just a pretty powerful scenario here. And, and, and as, these, as these prophets of Baal go ahead and build their, their altar and they put their bowl up there and they prepare it and everything is starting to unveil, you would, you would think that, that, that Elijah would maybe just sit back and be silent and he just would, uh, would observe and he'd probably be sitting there wondering, okay, how am I gonna set up my stones? How am I gonna plan this out? What's this gonna look like? How many pieces of wood should I, what, what am I gonna, he, you know, he'd, he'd just be rationalizing this whole thing, right? No. Instead, he starts to taunt the prophets of Baal. He's pretty bold. 450 to 1. 450 prophets who are on the side of the king and his wife. And he starts to taunt them. And all day long, this goes on and there's no fire. And then Elijah says, hey, it's my turn. Let's build this up. And he goes ahead and he builds his, his altar and he, he prepares the bowl and he puts it on and then he steps forward and he says a simple prayer to God. And at that moment, fire rained down, the altar was lit up and when you read this in, in chapter 18, after water, 12 uh, 12 pitchers of, or 12 jars of water have been poured out over this and it's soaking wet. The fire comes down and when the, the fire of, in verse 38, then the fire of the Lord burned up the sacrifice, the wood, the stones and the soil and also licked up the water in the trench. It didn't just ignite the lumber, it lit everything up. There was nothing left. The power of God fell from heaven. And then there's a response of the people. And they start to cry out, the Lord, he is God, the Lord, he is God. Just like Elijah knew what happened. And then Elijah commands the heavens to open and rain comes. But just after all this amazing opportunity that Elijah not only partook in, but he observed and, and the rise up of the voices of the people who, who have probably just days, minutes before had been bowing down to Baal, who just stood in silence as he asks if they, if they will worship God. And now they're praising him because of what happens. Soon after, we see Elijah retreat and he starts to run. Let's pick up in verse nine, uh, chapter 19, verse one. Now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. 
So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that of one of them. Because right after all this happened, Elijah had, had commissioned for the prophets of Baal to be slaughtered. And Jezebel is, is in outrage. She's, she's not even focusing in on what God has done. She's focusing in on the pieces that Elijah had done. She, she took her eyes, she, she, her eyes never focused on what God had done. She kept her eyes focused on what Elijah had done. And so she says, I'm gonna treat you the same way if, because if I don't, then, then, then my God, who didn't do anything with the fire that, you command, that, that the prophets were commanding him to do, my God will kill me. And Elijah could have looked at her and he could have stuck his tongue out, wiggled his rear end a little bit and said, yeah, right. That's not how this is gonna work. I just went toe to toe with your husband. I just went toe to toe with your prophets. And my God reigned. But instead, verse three happens. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there. While he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, he came to a broom bush, sat down under it, and prayed that he might die. I've had enough, Lord, he said. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. Point number two. Faith-driven people are not exempt from backsliding. Faith-driven people are not exempt from backsliding. Elijah just had one of the most powerful moments in his life. Some have labeled him the boldest prophet of all time. He went toe-to-toe with the king of Israel and commissioned fire from God in the power of his prayer to come down and prove that God is who he says he is. And yet when Jezebel comes and says, I'm going to take your life, he took his eyes off of who God was and what was going on, and he ran. Did he run in fear for his life? Did, was, was he frustrated because maybe the, 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 the revolution wasn't as much as he expected it to be? Was, was it because Ahab and Jezebel at that moment didn't get down on their knees and, and offer their lives to Jesus? I, we don't know. But what we can see is that he got terrified enough that he ran. He took his eyes off of God and he fled. Some of us, this weekend might look at him and say, what a loser. How could you do that? You, you, you just ask the people. If Baal's Baal, then if Baal's God, then follow him. And if God's God, then, then follow him. And, and yet you took your eyes and you ran. Wow. For those of us hearing this message, we need to understand that less might be the most difficult. Standing where we are right now might be the most difficult. Just because he, he, he did, Elijah had all this, this, this popular story that many of us have probably heard and read and taught from before doesn't mean that that difficult was, was the, the more was difficult. This lesser action might have been just to stand up to Jezebel and, and look her in the face and say, it's not gonna happen. To, to be able to put aside whatever emotions and attitudes he was feeling might have been more difficult. Just as quickly as we run to, we may run from. Just as quickly as we, we run into a situation where we're so bold and, and we know it's, we're on the mountaintop. I mean, he's on the top of Mount Carmel, mountaintop experience. Just as quickly as we run to that and we know we're going to get energized and, and he had this experience that was above and beyond. He quickly ran from. And we might too. Sometimes the experience that God gives us is different from from how we want to experience him. Sometimes the experience that, that God gives us is different than the experience than, than, what, than we wanted. 
And, and we're gonna get a chance to, to see here in, in, in this, this next uh, couple of verses how God wants to show up and, and how he wants to, to redeem this, this worn out, this fearful, this running Elijah. And, 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 and we, we wanted to maybe see him just take him and spin him around and say, what's your deal, man? How, how can you run so far? How, how, how can you run away and, and hide from this? But instead, God shows up in the way that he wants to. And we're gonna get a chance to see that. So let's continue on in 1 Kings chapter 19, verses nine through 12. As we see the response of the Lord. And the, Lord, and the word of the Lord came to him. Elijah had just had two, um, two experiences with an angel coming to him in this cave. And, and, and the word of the Lord came to him and he says, what are you doing, Elijah? Verse 10. He replied, I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword, and I'm the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me too. The Lord said, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood in the mouth of the cave. Then the, voices, then the voice said to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? Might not have been the experience that we expected. It might not have been the way that, that we expected God to, to come back and, 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 and turn Elijah around. But there is something that, that we can learn. The, the third and last point is this. God's invitation is always the same. It might not come in the way that we expect it. <laughs> it might not come from who we expect it to come from. It might not come when we expect it. But God's invitation is always the same. It didn't matter who Elijah was or what he had experienced. And church, that's, that's, that's the same from, from the heart of PLC. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done, or where you've been. We believe that Jesus wants to know you and make himself known to you. And we know, beyond a shadow of a doubt, we're going to do our best to make that happen from the ministry as, as we are the hands and feet of Jesus. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done or where you've been. It doesn't matter how high economically you are. It doesn't matter how low economically you are. It doesn't matter if you're divorced or remarried. It doesn't matter if you've been married, no children, children. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how much trouble you've gotten yourself into or how much you've been able to avoid. The invitation is always the same. It doesn't matter if for, for some of the most powerful moments in the history of man, you were able to stand toe to toe with the world and look at it square in the eye and say, you're not gonna have any of this. And then the next breath, run away with your tail between your legs in fear of what's to come. It doesn't matter because the God of the universe wants to invite you the same way that he's been inviting man for all eternity. No questions asked. He wants us to constantly experience his awesomeness. I think if he could have spoken this in, 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 in my ways to Elijah, it would have been just simply this. I'll, I'll join you on this mountaintop but you'll never have to endure the desert that I endured for you. I'll, I'll, I'll join you on this mountaintop, but you'll never have to en endure the desert that, that I've endured for you. That was the place that Elijah had, had, had run to. That was the place that Elijah was, was, was in when God called him to, to come up to the top of the mountain. And, 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 I, and I think if he could have just simply said that, he would have said, man, come on. My invitation's still the same. 
what, what happened back there is, is, is history. Today's a new day. Come and live, not just with me, but for me. My plan, Elijah, isn't dependent upon your faith. Your faith is dependent upon my plan. And my plan kept moving forward even when you wavered. Even when you took your eyes off of who I was and and what I was doing. And you forgot about how awesome I am and what I have in store for you. I continue to move on and move ahead of you and prepare the way. Even when you wavered, Elijah. Maybe, maybe this weekend, you're the guy who was born and raised in the church. And your parents taught you that Jesus loves you. This they knew. Because the Bible told them so. And you're in your mid-30s or 40s and, and you're just trying to figure out life and, 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 you, and you know that truth, but you're tiptoeing back and forth trying to figure out how in the world could this even be true? Maybe you're the mom who is a superhero when it comes to serving in the church, her neighborhood, her occupation, the places she volunteers at. But man, when that five, six, seven-year-old doesn't want to stay in bed at night and the 14-year-old is, is pushing you to your limits, you step back. You take your eyes off the king that you served all day and you look in the mirror and, and you see fear instead of him. And you ask yourself very simply, how did my number one so quickly move to beyond number three? Maybe you're the student, the child, who, who's been through some amazing experiences this summer in your time out of school and, and you've, you've, you've been searching and, and you've been understanding that, that there's, there's something more to life. But the decisions you've made up to this point, you feel like there's no way that the God of the universe could love you. The same invitation he gave to Elijah is the invitation he wants to extend to you today. No questions asked. It doesn't matter who you are, what you've done or where you've been. God wants you to know him. Isn't it great that God's plan isn't dependent upon our faithfulness, but yet he opens our hearts and our minds to understand that the plan that he's put before us, our faith can depend on it. In a few moments, your campus pastor is going to come up and he's gonna share some application, just some, some, some gut-wrenching questions with you. But before he does, let's, let's go before the king. Father God, we might feel like day in and day out we missed the mark. Or, or, or we might feel like we're, we're, we're on the fence and, and sometimes we're just completely sold out with you, but, but yet the other foot's still on the other side. And sometimes we just totally, completely turn our backs to you and, and we not only walk, but we run away. Maybe because we, we don't think there's any way that you could love us. Or maybe it's because of how bad we've been beat up by the world. But God, we are so thankful that we can lay down everything at your feet and we can depend on your plan and that you're not dependent upon our faithfulness. Your glory is sufficient. So Father God, no matter where we are this weekend, would you open our hearts and our minds
to where you want us to go. Help us to understand and, and see the hand of your son as he not only endured the cross, but he also conquered the grave. Jesus, it's in your holy and precious name that we pray. Amen.